Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to The Tom Woods Show. It is episode 2460, and we're joined once again by our old friend Dominic Frisbee, the man who defies introduction. As you can see, among his books is a title you can see right in the background, Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future. We bought a copy of that when we were in London so we could get it signed by old Dominic Frisbee. He is, I don't know how else to describe him. He's a content creator, a singer, a comedian, a playwright, a kind of a playwright, I think, it's safe to say. Uh, he's, he's also a, a, a really, really impressive and important uh, financial commentator. He has a substack, The Flying Frisbee. I, I don't know, it's Frisbee, F-R-I-S-B-Y, everybody. Um, no trademark symbol next to it. But there ought to be, given the uniqueness of uh, mm -hmm. our friend Dominic Frisbee. So welcome back. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And do you know what Frisbee means? I don't. It means village of the Frisian Islanders. Have you heard of the Frisian Islands? They're, I have, island. I have, yeah. but I didn't make the connection. And as in, you might have had, do you have Frisian cows in the States? Black and white cows would be Frisian cows. Uh, well, then I guess we must. I mean, normally when I drive by them, they never look like the ones in the cartoons, but there must be some <laughs> somewhere. Well, those black and white cows, and they would be from the Frisian Islands, which would be off the coast of... Germany and um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to change the settings because I've just got a slight echo on my audio. So I'm just going to very quickly do that and do that. And yes, the, the Frisian Islands is a group of islands off the coast of Holland and Germany. And there were invaders. They were among the invaders that came along with the Vikings and people like that. And they and, and you stick BY on the end of the name, and it just means village. So it just means vill village of the Frisian Islanders. There we go. Can I assume you have visited there then? No, I have never been. Oh. To my great shame. How about that? All right. Well, I got a little travel lined up uh, maybe uh, for this year that maybe I'll uh, make mention of later because of the politics involved. But just last night, when I should have been sleeping, just last night, I booked a flight. Uh, for my wife and me to Argentina, where we've never been. Oh, when are you going? November. Oh, yeah. so I'm, I want to get there in May if I can. That yeah, I mean, the thing hero. is, we're, we're pretty tight the rest of the year, so uh, November seemed pretty good for us. But, yeah, I think, that, I, I think it'll be fun. I, I, mean, I want to go there and I want to, make a, I want to make a documentary about him because, like, you know, we libertarians, we've... For, for ever since I've discovered libertarianism, we've just sat on the sidelines and gone, oh, it's wrong. It would be much better if there was no government. This is how it should all be run. And it's like, we've got the comfort of knowing that it's never actually going to happen in real life uh, to prove us wrong. And then suddenly, here we go. It's actually happening in real time around us. Yeah. And, and so I want to go and, you know, see if it actually works. You and I both know, of course it does. Yes, um, of course. The big, the big, the big, doubt is 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 how much of his ideas he can get through congress and all the rest right of, it. of course of course well i haven't been to south america in a really long time and it's a nice way to go to a foreign country without really being hit at least as a as a north american by jet lag with the uh with a big big mm -hmm. time change it's only a couple hour time difference for me uh if i if i go down there so so th so that's going to be a lot of fun and I and I and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit later. But I want to start off. They can wine tour. I, I'm looking forward to. I, we've we've already started to make a list of uh, things we're going to do, and people will see. And I'm, unfortunately, Malay doesn't speak really uh, doesn't speak much English. No, 
And and I've had I've had people deny this to me. It was so weird. And and my I sent out an email newsletter saying, yeah, his his English isn't you know he knows some words, but he's not really fluent in English. And I've had people indignantly tell me, no, he speaks great English. And what I think has happened is they've maybe listened to him with a simultaneous English <laughs> translation over his voice. They think that's him, but that's not. Yeah, you know, it's like Michael J. Voice. Fox is not singing the song in Back to the Future. You know, <laughs> so I have to say it's unusual. Like, I've got a lot of Argentinian friends, and they all speak excellent English. And these, there's, these are, and these are Argentinians who I met in South America, not Argentinians who I met in London, where you'd expect them to speak English. And it's normal for Argentinians to speak decent English. So I'm yeah. surprised, particularly educated Argentinians, and I'm assuming Malay comes from an educated background. He certainly comes from an enlightened background, yes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, so I'm surprised he doesn't speak better. But maybe it's a power thing, and he chooses. Like I, I speak fluent Italian, but often if I'm in Italy, it's often better to pretend you don't speak Italian because it, it's just a sort of power play. Ah, interesting. Okay, like if you're okay. talking to authority, it's it's better to not speak Italian and make them speak English because then they're on they're and they they've got a they're on they're in the weak they're in the weak point then you see you know you know but uh, you know this is um, I I sh we should be talking about other things but who cares we'll get to them in a minute this is an argument I've had with my wife before because we were in uh, we were in Vienna mm -hmm. and I and and when we would walk down the street now I I studied German for reading knowledge but when you mm -hmm. study a, a language for reading knowledge they they genuinely don't teach you conversational German no so I I never learned how to say hi how are you but I did learn how to attack an attack is the right word, a German sentence. German sentences need to be attacked, you know, to, to pull them apart and make sense of them. And I just felt like a big dope walking down the streets of Vienna going, hey, that's a nice looking building, you know, in English. And so I would keep my English a little hushed. We did the same thing in Spain. I did the same thing in Spain. I just felt mm -hmm. like it's, it's bad manners. And she mm -hmm. thinks I'm psychotic to, 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 to act like this. But I feel like, no, it's their country, and they speak this other language. And for me to go around, blah, 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 blah I, I just feel like it was, especially within Spain, I can speak some Spanish. So while I'm over there, I should speak Spanish. And so I feel like with it, with Italy, I feel like I would be a better guest to people who have allowed me into their country if I spoke their language. Well, I think there's something to that. And when you go somewhere, I think you often want to show some respect to yes. the place that you go to, you know, common courtesy, manners, whatever word you want to use for it. And I definitely remember as a young boy, I used to live in South Kensington, Gloucester Road, and there was a lot of tourists in that area. And you'd hear, you'd have these sort of really loud American tourists with, you know, Hawaiian shirts and, and fat bellies and shorts and all that <laughs> walking around. And they were just so loud. And you, part of you just wanted to go, oh, do be quiet. Just come and shut it. Be quiet. There's something Me about too, the American accent. Very Me loud. Too. <laughs> but so, but, but, um, so maybe there's a bit of that, but I think a lot of the time, you know, it, like if, if, I bet the average Austrian, Austria in particular is a very polite country. They're very polite people. It's the Germanic thing. But I bet you that if you were there, an Austrian would, would be delighted. One, for an opportunity to speak to an American, somebody from a different culture, and two, an opportunity to practice his English. Because <laughs> it's fun yes. speaking foreign languages. But I, I do take your point. It's a sort of, it's a courtesy thing to at least, you know, say thank you in the language of the country that you're in. Right, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I've, I've, I'm giving it a shot. Now, and now meanwhile, I, I'm making my second trip to Iceland in a little, uh, little bit, a uh, couple of months, uh, bringing three of my daughters with me. And in that case... Maybe we'll learn an Icelandic phrase here or there, but they all speak English because what else are you going to do? You're a country of 340,000 people. You can't expect anybody to know your language. What else are you going to do other than learn the universal language, in effect? Yeah, and it's funny, Iceland. I, I went there a year or two ago, and I just loved it. It's the most visually stunning place ever. But it's full of Americans because it's it's a really easy, like it's only about a three or four hour flight from from the Northeast Coast, right. New York and Boston. So a lot of Americans will go there on like weekend trips and it's, it's a, but it's a great country. Yeah, I, I have friends who just built a cabin there. I, I could, you know, I, I'm not saying I could see myself settling there necessarily, like if, if, if I had that option, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. And it looks, it has a look that is so different 
Like if oh, you go to so, Reykjavik, it's so different from every other European mm. capital. It's so cinematic. You know, Iceland, even Iceland, and you'd think being an island and being remote and all the rest of it has got a huge problem with immigration. I think they've got, I, I read some stat, I'm going to get it wrong, but I, I went to this workshop a few weekends ago with a load of Icelandic people. I think in that population of 350,000, they've got immigration, they've got something like 50 to 100,000 immigrants in a, in oh, a population. In, I mean, it's just, and you'd think, you know, like mainland Europe, you can understand, but Iceland, you're like, how do they get there? But yeah, they've, they've got a real <laughs> no, problem. Exactly. You can think easily some people just walk over the border to get to another country. Yeah. How are they getting to Iceland? Yeah, mm -hmm. I hear that. And, and Iceland is, uh, you know, kind of an expensive place to, to live. Mm -hmm. The cost of living is pretty high. So it wouldn't be my first choice if I were moving from one country to another. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, we won't necessarily yeah. dwell on that, but... All right, let's let's bring it back to to a more general topic. Sure. So, a, as we're recording this, mm -hmm. um, which is probably two days before it's it's going to be released, um, Bitcoin is on the verge of hitting its all time high, not in nominal terms. Yeah. Perhaps with uh, price inflation, maybe it already has hit its all time high in terms of the dollar. And whenever this happens, there's always um, a flurry of interest in it. You know, all your friends who thought you were a dope suddenly want your advice, you know, <laughs> and they want to know what to do. And I know people who have gotten in at the top. I know people who got in at the top at 69K, who it's been all losses for them since then, but, but they've just waited and waited for the most part. So let's, let's first start with this. I don't think anybody really knows really why most Bitcoin price fluctuations occur. Now, prove me wrong. I mean, there I can imagine some big major thing is occurring with Bitcoin itself, that can do it. Or there's some major government policy affecting Bitcoin. But parentheses, I remember the sweet, naive old days when people would tell me, there's nothing government can do to obstruct Bitcoin. Yes, there is. They can declare that you have to pay capital gains tax on it when you convert it into dollars. That's something they can do. Anyway, end of parentheses. Those big things I get. But I, I kind of suspect that nobody quite fully gets why, exactly why, at a particular moment, it suddenly shoots up. Am I wrong? I'm happy well, to be wrong on this. Yeah, I mean, the, what's the big trigger for this move in Bitcoin has been the launch of the ETFs. Yes. And um, the, what, when you normally get moves in Bitcoin, they normally come around what's called the halving. And that's when the, the new mine supply comes down. In other words, Bitcoin's become that bit more scarce. Now, it might be a psychological thing, uh, or it might be an actual thing. But I've noticed you almost always get a mania around a new technology. So you saw it obviously around dot com. You saw it around railways in the 19th century. You saw it around... Um, you know, 3D printing stocks, biotech, uh, you know, NVIDIA and all the AI stuff that's going on now. So you always, always get um, a mania around new technology. People get excited about it. There's a very compelling story. You know, dot com is going to change the world. The whole world's going to be using the internet, blah, blah, blah. And so you get these manias, these bubbles, if you like. But one of the reasons you get the bubble is because the underlying narrative behind why you should invest in this technology is true. So railways did change the, the, the world. The internet did change the world. 3D printing is going to be amazing. But often what happens is the market gets ahead of itself. So with Bitcoin, what you have is you've got the excitement about a new technology. But then you factor in that the new technology is money. It's kind of double bubble, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So you just get these, these really emotional, uh, volatile cycles where it has an up cycle, two, three years, then it'll have a correction of about a year, then it'll go sideways for about a year, and then it'll have another one of these up cycles. And since its inception in 2009, Bitcoin has had six, six corrections of 80%. And yet here we are 
It's $65,000. I just looked before this interview began. So here we are, just a couple of percent off its all-time highs, and it's had six 80% corrections. And what's really exciting, because it, it always rebounds or always seems to rebound, what's so exciting about it is that once we break through 69,000, every single person that ever bought Bitcoin ever, as long as they didn't sell, is in profit. And I think that's quite an exciting thought, as long as they didn't sell. Of course, everyone has sold some Bitcoin at some point and regretted it. Um, so, yeah, it's all very exciting. And, and But the big trigger for this move is, it's, it's one, the ETFs enable a lot more capital to come into Bitcoin, but two, they legitimize it. And so suddenly, mm. you, you know, Bitcoin is now part of the mainstream financial system, and, and so suddenly institutions can buy ETFs and they don't have to sort of be weird and send their money to exchanges and be a little bit contrarian. So just from a whole kind of acceptance level, from a whole kind of career risk point of view, but also from a regulatory point of view, these ETFs have proved a massive enabler. And then in a month or two, we've got the next halving, actually even less than a month, we've got the next halving. So the, the new mine supply from um, mining is going to, Half as well. So these all add to the narrative. But I, th this, if you look at where the low was, the low came about 15 months ago. Uh, you know, if this cycle is typical and copies other cycles, we've probably still got another year of bull market before it's over. Wow. Okay. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here with another word on behalf of the outstanding monetary medals, where I have been very happy to have an account because I earn interest on my gold, paid in gold. And I'm very happy to be joined today for this extremely brief mini interview with Addison Qualley, who actually works for Monetary Metals. How'd that come about? Uh, and I think you have a job where you actually really believe in what you do. That's correct, Tom. Uh, basically, I am the VP of Relationships here at the company. Um, I've been here since 2013. And I, I basically lead the sales department and help people come on board Monetary Metals uh, and help handle their accounts. Um, I've always been a, a big fan of freedom. Uh, somehow along the way, uh, was a fan of freedom just from high school. That really kicked up a notch when I started following your show in, in 2013. And um, I was working at a gold company at the time. Um, I came to understand that gold is honest money and a very good thing. And um, when I learned about monetary metals uh, back then, uh, around 2016, it just seemed like something that could really change the world for good. Uh, if you can earn interest on gold and finance in gold, um, that is potentially world changing and you can get gold to come back into the monetary system. So that really excited me. I jumped ship from my old company. I joined Monetary Metals back then. And, um, you know, one of the exciting ideas we had in our head was at the time, Uber was kind of taken out the New York City taxi cabs and Uber had gone viral. And we thought, you know, if interest on gold, if earning yield on gold could go viral, uh, maybe that could uh, become a legitimate alternative to the dollar. And um, we're, we're excited to be growing a lot uh, since then. Uh, the company's grown by leaps and bounds, and um, it's been a very exciting journey. Well, I'm very glad to be able to be a very small part of it. So find out more and join me. Open up your own account with Monetary Metals. Head over to monetary-metals.com slash woods. To get more information, that's monetary-metals.com slash woods. Well, I actually never have, I've never sold any Bitcoin. And I, uh, now I got in a little bit late-ish. I think I probably bought my first Bitcoin around uh, 2016. But I mean, that's not crazy late, but it's not, I wasn't a first adopter or anything. And when they made that decision that in the U.S., if you have a gain with your Bitcoin, you sell it and convert it into cash, you have to pay uh, capital, mm -hmm. gains, capital tax gains tax on that. In the US, that ranges, depending on your income, between zero and 20%. And I'll tell you something, I ain't never paying these SOBs that 20%. That is not happening. That is not happening. I will hold on to this thing, uh, to, to this quantity of Bitcoin that I have, um, and I know you're supposed to hold it forever till you die, although I'm not exactly sure what that point of that is. I'd like to enjoy some windfall with it while I'm still alive. But, mm -hmm. but I will say that my hope is 
that the political class also becomes interested in Bitcoin because then they will have a personal interest in getting rid of this capital gains tax problem that's on it. Do you have the same situation in the UK where this would be a taxable moment if you converted your Bitcoin into pounds? Yeah, we do. And the first thing I would say, Tom, is you'll often see um, Bitcoiners lobbying companies to go, you should accept Bitcoin. So, for example, when Elon Musk got on got into it in the last cycle, they were telling him, everyone was going, you should sell, you should be able to buy Teslas with Bitcoin. And I think at one point you could buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. Now, the reason, one of the reasons Bitcoin is like that is obviously, well, there's two reasons. One is it spreads adoption and spreads awareness and legitimizes it. But two, um, you could use your Bitcoin to buy a car and the taxability of that event is less clear. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So I do. So that, that's, that's one thing. So, so if, you, you know, if you can spend your Bitcoin, you haven't actually made the gains, the, right. the taxable gains. So, so that's quite an interesting thought. The, but the, yeah, the, the capital gains tax, it's funny how government things back, backfires, but it, it encourages people to hold and not to sell because people are like, and some of the gains that people have made in Bitcoin are so extraordinary. They're like, you know, if you make a million pounds, I'm not giving 200 grand to government. Now, yeah. coming to the UK, we have capital gains tax at the same rate, 20%. And, but what the UK have done, which is so stupid, we have our prime minister when he was chancellor, Rishi Sunak, who's gone, we're turning Britain into a crypto hub. And George Osborne said the same when he was chancellor and, you know, had himself, there was a video of him buying Bitcoin from an ATM and all this. And so they they give it the big one, but then our um, we have an, an organisation called the Financial Conduct Authority, which I guess would be the equivalent of the SEC or something like that. But it's the 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 body, the government body that regulates finance, and they have made it almost impossible for UK citizens to own Bitcoin. For example, the ETFs that any ordinary American can buy they're illegal. The UK citizens aren't allowed to buy them. <laughs> That's and unbelievable. So we got the, yeah, it's just so nuts. And so, and then if you try um, transferring money from a UK bank to a crypto exchange, you have no idea the headache. And a lot of banks just won't allow you to, even though it's your money, they refuse to send it. And, and you're like, how is that even possible? But anyway, so the, it's, it's a brilliant example of the incoherence at the heart of government where you've got the prime minister saying one thing and then the bodies that are underneath him doing something totally opposite. Well, meanwhile, uh, you've also been writing about gold, and gold has been doing very well. But it, it has. Now, it's, it's, it's quietly broken out. To Normally, when gold breaks out of new eyes, all the gold bugs are making a load of noise about it. But there's so much noise around Bitcoin, nobody's noticed yeah. gold breaking out to new eyes. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And so, so you've written a little bit about that. Now, see, again, there are times when I feel like Bitcoin or um, gold should act a certain way, and, and they don't. Like, for example, when, when COVID hit and the lockdowns hit, as I recall, Bitcoin just plummeted. And yet you could see why it shouldn't have, because you would think, well, all right, the spending spigots are about to open like wild, and the, the, uh, the, the money printing, we can tell, we, we know they're going to go overboard with that. So Bitcoin is, mo is more of a safe haven from that. It seems like it should have shot up. to me. You know, like, that doesn't make sense. Like, why would Bitcoin? Bitcoin's going to come through COVID, no problem. You know, so sometimes I, I don't, like, I can devise a narrative that I feel like it should have followed, but it didn't. Yeah, well, Bitcoin and gold both fell uh, going into COVID, going into lockdowns, but there was a huge liquidity crisis, so everything sold off. Yeah, Almost so I guess it's happen. that. Yeah, and, but they came, they bounced out of it pretty hard, coming yeah. out of it. Gold had a really good six months from sort of March to August. But yeah, I mean, I've been writing about markets, Tom, for 20 years. And one of the things I've learned is people always want a reason. Why did this happen? And then, you know, and, and, and you'll see like the, the newspapers will go, Dow rises on Biden's comments about Israel or something. And you're like, no, the Dow didn't rise because Biden made comments on Israel. The Dow rose because for whatever reason it rose. And a lot of the time, we like 
we like an explanation. The human psychology likes an explanation. But a lot of the time, the market just does what it does. And it, it's, as, it's as trite as saying more buyers than sellers. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. You know, right, and, right. You, you know, you didn't go out and buy the Dow today because of Biden's comments on Israel. Do you, do you know what I mean? You just... No, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, it helps that I, I, I insulate myself from whatever Biden's comments on Israel are. Yeah. But I understand your point. I understand your point. Um, now, I'm going to shift gears for just a minute because sure. of something you've just done recently. Um, the, you, so you, you've, you've done a number of videos and, and songs uh, over the years that um, you have made a bit of an impact. And so you've just released one about the Illuminati that I would actually like to share with everybody before we proceed with the conversation, if you wouldn't mind. Can you set this up for us? What are we about to see here? Well, I... Um, I, I it, I, one of my, I, I do two things. One is I write about markets, but the other thing I do is it's a stand-up comic who performs comic songs. And this is uh, my latest comic song, and we shot it um, in the, uh, my lady friend who you know, who you met, we had lunch with, she shot it on her phone, the video. She's a professional director, but she shot it oh, on her phone in, okay. the, um, in the mountains just outside Palm Springs. And so that was the video. I, I'm not supposed to say that, but I'm sure she won't mind because she wants. <laughs> she doesn't want her reputation ruined, so she keeps she she's she's kept her name anonymous <laughs> in the credits. <laughs> but anyway, and then a friend of mine edited it and made it look very good. And so yeah, this is this is my latest comic song, and I think your listeners will find it very amusing. And it is called. I want to be in the Illuminati. I just love it so much. Okay, everybody, here we go. I dream of a better future for me and my family. Though mainly me, I'll scheme with the rich and powerful. Life would be so easy. I want to be in the Illuminati. How do you get into the club? I want an invite to an Epstein party. Bet it's even better than the pub. I want to formulate the new world order and join the 0.1%. I really want to be a duke or lord or baron in a one-world government. They're known to be prone to paedophilia. Their symbols a triangle with an eye. And with Satan, they're familiar. Thirteen pure blood lines. Yikes, how they like to harvest adrenaline and inject the blood of juveniles. It is rumored they are alien, some form of reptile. Yes, they are blessed. Such success is why some think they're wizards. But no, that's not so. Don't you know they are shape-shifting lizards? I'll sell my soul to the Illuminati for lots of glory, wealth and fame. To be a Rothschild or DuPont or Barclay, I'll do anything, I have no shame. How do you get in the Illuminati? Just like Madonna and Will Smith Barack Obama, Angelina Jolie I applied and they replied as if I want to stop you all from reproducing Impose population control I'll claim that human numbers need reducing So Bill Gates can vaccinate the proles I want to be in the same gang as Beyonce With secret codes and hieroglyphs I want to go to Davos with the nonces, sacrifice some babies with Sam Smith. I want to operate the banking system, own all the assets in the land. I want to snigger while the plebs eat insects, be in the Bilderberg group and hang out with former Nazis, worship the Prince of Darkness, control the Tory party, write songs with Paul McCartney. An Illuminati man. Okay, so well, what we just saw was uh, I Want to Be the Illuminati by our friend Dominic Frisbee. 
of all possible things you could have done, how did this pop into your head? Well, my son bought me a book about conspiracy theories. And it's like, like I find reading books these days really difficult because I always pick up my phone and read that instead. But this book just absolutely gripped me from start to finish. And I ended up writing a song about conspiracy theories called It's All True. But one of the... <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then i wrote that song and then i was like there's more in this and so i wrote the illuminati song as a sort of that was the sort of second conspiracy theory related song i wrote and the illuminati like who are they and you know everyone wants to be in the illuminati if, if you could be in the illuminati and have untold riches and untold wealth and untold this that and the other and be above the law and not have to pay 20% capital gains tax on your Bitcoin, you know, and, we, and be we, in on, be in on everything. Know, yeah, know what's really going on. Formulate right? the new world order and everything. So that's, it kind of, once, once I had that idea, it, the song kind of wrote itself really. Hey everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. Let's go back now. I, I, I was planning to talk about Argentina at the end. Um, but we we got into it a little bit. So I did notice when Javier Millet got elected that uh, there uh, that for the most part there was jubilation among folks like you and me. But within our ranks, we had some people who are who are skeptical. And I, I'm not I'm not uh, hostile toward people who are skeptical. I mean that's a good attitude to have. But I kind of felt like you know I think we've lost so many times that we don't know how to win. We don't know how yeah. to accept a win. There were people who were saying he was a WF stooge and it was fake libertarianism and that kind of thing. And I think what you have to realize with politics is real life is a lot more muddy and less defined than ideals. So, you know, as a libertarian, it doesn't matter if you're a libertarian or a socialist or a Marxist, whatever your political philosophy is. How many times have you heard socialists say that wasn't real socialism? You know, and you, you, you want things to fit exactly to the theory and the ideals. And real life just is not that clean. And so, you know, Malay will be libertarianism in action. But the, if you're a total purist, you'll be able to find fault with it and go, well, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. And so, just as socialists find fault with whatever, you know, Stalin did or, you know, whoever they're, the Marxist, um, president of choice is and yeah it, it's a win take it and it's not a wf you know if nothing else millet is a star and you know it, it's really interesting when he gave his speech at the wef and you know everyone was so excited about that speech but really it wasn't that good a speech and it, oh god somebody's calling me and he read it you know, he didn't look up from his, he's a great speaker and a great orator, but he just read, he looked down, he didn't see his eyes and he just read it, which is normally like golden rule of things not to do. Yeah. But because he's such a huge star and because libertarianism has got such a huge following online, I think within one day of his giving that speech, he had more than a million views on the WEF website. And the next most viewed speech was Macron Emmanuel Macron from France with 25,000. 
Oh, so, wow. so, you know, and if ever that gives, you know, and Ma- Macron is so kind of old world politics, the old yeah, politics. Yeah, who would want to watch his and, stupid speech? Well, exactly. And he was number <laughs> two. But the, the gulf between Millet and Macron just shows you what an appetite there is around the world, even for a, a, a speech that, that was just read out loud. It was brilliant because of where it was and who it was in front of. But actually, you know, and I've seen Millet's videos. He's so charismatic. Imagine if he'd gone out and done afuera, afuera, like he does to the WEF. Yeah. I mean, that really would have blown the roof off the place. But even him just reading a speech um, out loud to a bunch of people and, and an AI voice translating it, even that, he is a star. And, yeah. and he is good. He's going to get the libertarian message out. And governments have no imagination, partly because of the career risk and partly because of everything else. And so what they do is they do, like you saw it with COVID, nobody led. Everyone just copied everyone else. And the, 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 the one exception to that was Sweden. Everyone else copied everyone else. And they do that. They just copy what well, it work here, so we'll copy it. And it's a bit like the ETFs and legitimizing Bitcoin and taking out the career risk and making it acceptable for institutions to buy Bitcoin. Malay, even though the left is saying he's a, a far-right libertarian, how is that possible? But well, that's what they're saying. Malay is, you know, other governments around the world will go, like, do you remember how when um, Zelensky became a big star and Macron started dressing up in combat clothes to look like <laughs> <laughs> Zelensky? But well, Malay will highly, do that. But I highly doubt this means that European leaders are going to buy chainsaws now. No, but they'll start. He will legitimize it. He's just, he's shifted the Overton window. And he has. They'll start copying him, and and then they'll go. Oh, actually, getting rid of the Department of something is it actually works. And do you know what the Department of such and such has always got on my nerves. So do you know what? Let's get rid of them. He kind of he, he it, they, it, it it it's 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 like. It's like herpes. It spreads. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have friends who have been over there. Uh, I have friends who live there. Um, and their impression is that the, the man on the street wants him to succeed. The man on the street is not an anarcho-capitalist or anything like that, but they, they recognize that, you know, all the smooth talkers haven't accomplished anything. So why don't we give this, um, you know, this, this loose cannon a try? So I think it will be interesting when I get there in November, where it will have been about a full year, yeah. to see then how, what is the public mood at that time? Yeah, I mean... One of the sort of loves of my life, who I met when I was 26, 27 years old, backpacking around Bolivia, um, and we had a sort of holiday love affair. She went on back to Argentina. She became a big star in Argentina, big TV star, and she's now a director. And I think she's directed three, four, five films, something like that. And, but she is your archetypical, you know, left-wing Democrat theatrical you know, everything we rail against. And I sent her a joking tweet um, after Malay got elected, you know, putting a smiley face or something. And she'd sent me the most aggressive voice message I've ever received from anyone. She said, do not associate me with that man. Delete that tweet. Get rid of him. And she, you know, she absolutely loathes him. And our kind of mutual friends going, yeah, well, that's because she's funded four films and they've all been funded by government subsidy and he's going to oh, turn that to us. <laughs> yeah. But, but there's, a, there's a core of, of left-wingers who really will not like him at all. Oh, right. Well, that I don't doubt. And but so that's why when I said the man on the street, it, that is not who the man on the street no. is. The, the regular person with no ideological commitments, just pragmatic, uh, feels like, well, you know, what, what's, the, what's the harm giving this guy a try? So, um, so I'm looking forward to having that, uh, that opportunity. Um, is there any travel in the uh, Dominic Frisbee future, perhaps even to our wonderful United States? Well, um, I was in California. My mom lives in California, so I go out quite a bit. Um, but I was there just in January. Um, but I've got to say, America's expensive. To an English person, America is really... Food is twice the price in the States that it is in London. Oh, we're all complaining about that at this moment, it's by the way. It's so dear. I was like, you know, my eyes would start bleeding every time I went to the supermarket. Yeah, on the, the other hand, oh yeah, supermarket, that's one thing. Restaurant meals, 
that's because our restaurants are just better than yours. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> let's just be honest about the situation. Um, yeah, we'll discuss this at a, at a, at a later <laughs> time when we've both got weapons. The, uh, <laughs> but the, like when I was a kid growing up, America was cheap. The pound was much stronger. And in my head, America was cheap. You know, stuff was half the price in America that it was in the UK. And, and now, you know, America felt expensive. But in any case, um, then I haven't got any travel plans, but I will be traveling. And the place I really want to go to is Argentina. Same with you. Well, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. I wonder if you'll make a video when you're down there. Well, I'd love to make a documentary about Malay and his policies. Yeah. Um, in fact, we might look at crowdfunding something. But 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 anyway, I'd I'd love to. I just want to get there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear feel you. Like but that, that's a being really. Made there at the moment. I beg your pardon. I feel like history is being made there at the moment. I think so too, and and I think, I think it would be good for you, and I think it would be good for the world if you if you did that project. So I, and and I mean, I, like, you want to come back on here and help kick off the uh, crowdfunding? I mean, I've 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 had a good track record of that, bringing people oh. on, and because I have listeners who you know they they put their money where their mouth is. They're not they're not fake. You've got good listeners. I do. I do. I'm deeply grateful for them all. Well, Don McFrisbee, what what should people do now when they say, "Holy cow! I have not had enough of this this interesting fellow in my life." What what's the next step? Um, sh share. I want to be in the Illuminati far and wide. Oh, but by and the way, that link will be in the video description right here, and it will also be at tomwoods.com/slash/2460, the show notes page. But also, how many videos are there called "I Want to Be in the Illuminati"? You could also just type it in. <laughs> And um, yeah, I've got two mailing lists. I've got one for comedy stuff, and that's Frisbee's News. And I've got one for financial stuff, theflyingfrisbee.com. So please join either or both of these. And, I have um, joined them both, just so you all know. Ah, I'm on both. Good for you, Tom. And um, yeah, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I love your company, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, likewise, and I appreciate that you're a guy who, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, I can trying to conceal my panic at having only two guests lined up for the week, I can send you a, a slightly edgy note saying, how'd you like to be on again? <laughs> you say, okay. Yeah, no, so it's thank a, you. I love it. I love it. Thank you for being such a good sport and for all the good work you do. Um, everybody check out Dominic Frisbee. As I say, tomwoods.com slash 2460. Also the video description. Uh, he's, he's one of the good guys for sure. And thank you very much for listening and watching, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.